morning or afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the NAI Director Seminar. Uh, I am really, really pleased to be able to introduce Jack Shostak today. I think Jack Shostak is probably well known to everybody and doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, but uh, I will say that Jack is associated not only with the Harvard Medical School, where he's in the Department of Genetics, but also the Massachusetts General Hospital, where he's in the Department of Molecular Biology, and he's also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Jack is very well known for his work on RNA evolution, and most recently he has been doing some very exciting work on designing an artificial cell. And what Jack is going to tell us today is what we can learn about the origin of life from efforts to design an artificial cell. And Jack, I will turn it directly over to you. Okay, thank you, Carl, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, talk to everybody today. Uh, so what I'd like to um, uh, tell you about is some of the recent work from my lab that's aimed at um, the synthesis of a very simple, uh, minimal artificial cell uh, and made out of uh, just uh, chemicals, simple chemicals. So in general, what we're uh, trying to do is get a better idea of what's required to make that leap from complicated chemistry to really simple biology. And so the main thing that that means uh, to me is that we want to see the spontaneous emergence of Darwinian evolutionary processes uh, from mixtures of the right kinds of chemical building blocks. Uh, so, more specifically, what we're trying to do is test uh, uh, particular aspects of, of uh, a model that we have in mind for what a very early primitive uh, protocell might have looked like. And so, on this uh, next slide, we have a schematic uh, diagram of the kind of um, <clears throat> construct that we're trying to put together. So this is a, a, a diagram of what we think are the minimal requirements uh, of a very early cell, and it has basically two uh, components, uh, a bilayer membrane, and inside it, uh, some kind of uh, uh, nucleic acid or related molecule that can carry information in the sequence uh, of its monomer building blocks. Okay, so um, this conception of an early cell builds uh, uh, heavily on the ideas of uh, uh, self-assembly, both chemical and physical. Uh, so we know that bilayer membranes can self-assemble uh, spontaneously from uh, amphicillic uh, small molecules. And we know that given activated nucleotides in the right environmental conditions, um, we can uh, spontaneously form uh, long RNA uh, polymers. So in addition to these self-assembly processes, though, what we need uh, for cellular behavior and for evolutionary behavior is the ability of the whole system uh, to grow and divide, to replicate. And so if we think first about the bilayer uh, cell membrane, uh, there have to be physical processes that allow uh, for additional monomers to become incorporated into the bilayer so that it can grow larger. And then also some kind of uh, process that will mediate division into smaller daughter cells. And, of course, the tricky part is that all of this has to happen without any uh, pre-existing complicated biological machinery. And we know that all modern cells, of course, devote a lot of infrastructure to the growth and division of their, of their cell membrane. In addition, same kinds of considerations apply uh, to the genetic material. Uh, so in modern biology, of course, we have a lot of complicated entomology uh, dedicated to the uh, replication of our genome. 
but in this case, we're trying to think of how something could emerge from a chemical system, and so what we've been focusing on are purely chemical systems, which would allow a template strand to be copied into a duplex and have the strands come apart and copy the single strands again, so that in the end you have um, daughter duplexes that can be distributed uh, to the daughter cells. And so if this cycle can go round and round indefinitely, uh, what we imagine is that eventually um, <clears throat> uh, sequences will diverge and eventually some kind of uh, sequence will, will arise that does something helpful to the cell, some way improves the efficiency of replication either of the genetic material or the cell itself or the whole structure. And such molecules should have an advantage and gradually come to take over the population. And that kind of uh, genetic change in population structure is the essence of Darwinian evolution. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that we'd like to put together in a laboratory. And uh, so that means we have to start thinking about the kinds of molecules that are going to go into these structures, so the cell membrane and the genetic material. And also we have to think about uh, energy sources. Um, and uh, so just to touch on that, uh, of course, this kind of system is inherently a uh, far from equilibrium system. There are a lot of ways that energy can uh, go into the system. So we'll be supplying uh, from the environment activated nucleotides. So there's chemical energy uh, in the activated nucleotides. We have possibility for mechanical energy to mediate uh, cell division. Uh, energy is released in the phase transfer as new molecules integrate into the bilayer uh, uh, membrane uh, structure and, and so on. Uh, so, so both uh, uh, matter in the form of new building blocks and energy uh, will be flowing through this system and mediating the overall growth and reproduction. <clears throat> okay, so one other aspect of this is that this is such a simple uh, minimal cellular structure that it's growth and division relies on a correspondingly complicated environment. And uh, so in this conception, we're thinking of environmental chemistry as supplying the various building blocks that are required for these processes, uh, as well as the various uh, uh, sources of, of, of energy. Okay, so I know this is a very particular model. There are a lot of different ideas. Not everyone accepts this. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that think that all the building blocks would have to arise internally from localized chemical reactions. Um, but we're, in our experiments, not really directly concerned with the origins of the building blocks. Our particular assumption is they come from external environmental chemistry. But we're really only trying to test ideas about how these molecules interact and generate larger structures um, that uh, might have the properties of living cells. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do then is just briefly go through um, the, the stages involved in building up this kind of uh, structure and the, and the associated processes of growth and division. Um, so we have to begin with the two basic components and think about how the vesicle uh, membrane itself could grow and divide. Uh, and then <clears throat> uh, separately, we can think about um, the genetic materials and how they could replicate. And then things start to actually get more interesting when you can think about what's required uh, to put these things together and have them work in a compatible way. And so in fact, today I'll be talking quite a bit about compatibility issues, uh, such as how the nucleotide building blocks for the genetic material might get across the membrane uh, to allow internal uh, replication of the genetic material. Uh, talk about that um, template copy and chemistry and its uh, compatibility with the uh, chemistry of the bilayer. And <clears throat> Uh, finally, the issue of, of how to get the strands apart so that after template copying, you can go to uh, subsequent rounds. And uh, I probably won't have time today to talk about the highest level of interactions, 
which are the, the uh, more cooperative or positive uh, interactions. These are the things we're just starting to work on. Okay, so. Okay, so I'm going to start off by uh, giving some background about uh, the kinds of vesicles and the kinds of molecules um, that we're uh, using to study um, uh, vesicles that uh, can grow and divide. Okay, and so the kinds of molecules we use are basically very uh, simple uh, fatty acids. And uh, the reason that we're not using uh, molecules you might be more familiar with, well, like phospholipids and cholesterol and phingolipids and so on, the components of modern biological membranes, is that uh, modern cell membranes are designed uh, to be very good barriers so that the protein machinery can control everything that gets in and out of modern cells. But, of course, in the first cells, there was no machinery to mediate the transport of molecules across the membrane, and so we need to make membranes that have more dynamic structures and which can allow uh, building blocks to get across and waste products to uh, get out of the cell spontaneously. And these are the kinds of molecules, it turns out, um, uh, that have the right properties. So we use uh, oleic acid or the shorter chain meristoleic acid uh, for a lot of our uh, model studies. And down here at the bottom, you see uh, capric acid, a saturated uh, uh, shorter chain fatty acid, uh, which is something that's a little bit more prebiotically uh, reasonable than the longer chain unsaturated fatty acids. But all of these molecules will self-assemble into um, uh, bilayer membranes, which can close up and make vesicles uh, uh, that you can see here in this micrograph. Okay, so these uh, fatty acid vesicles have a lot of uh, interesting properties, and uh, among them, one of the most important is the fact uh, that the fatty acids will self-assemble uh, into these larger, much larger structures. And uh, so that's just illustrated here. Uh, yeah, typically when they're um, at high pH, fatty acids will form small uh, aggregates uh, called micelles. Uh, as you lower the pH and uh, start to protonate more of the carboxylates, uh, these micelles can start to interact with each other, uh, assemble into small sheets, and eventually when the sheets grow large enough, uh, the thermal fluctuations will ensue and they'll gradually, eventually they'll round up and close in on themselves to make closed uh, vesicles. Uh, so this process is actually quite interesting and uh, a little bit complicated. Uh, there's a lag phase uh, due to this nucleation step. Uh, but interestingly, the reaction then becomes autocatalytic in that these intermediate structures and the final vesicles will actually catalyze, uh, accelerate the rate of formation of new vesicles. And that's something we'll come back to uh, shortly. Okay, so here is uh, an image that shows you uh, some of these uh, vesicles in the background and illustrates again this important phase transition. Uh, the fact that you go from micelles at high pH uh, and then these interact with each other and undergo this phase transition uh, to a bilayer state uh, at lower uh, pH. And this is very important because this allows us to uh, feed uh, pre-existing uh, vesicles uh, with new material in the form of fatty acids, and that is basically what allows them to grow. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I find uh, kind of fascinating about these structures is that they're very long-lived. The individual vesicles last indefinitely, at least weeks or months. Uh, but we know from other experiments that the, the molecule that they're made of uh, exchange uh, on the time scale of seconds. Okay. Uh, so in this image, you see two populations of vesicles labeled with different dyes. They've been mixed for a day, and you can see that the red and green vesicles have remained separate. So they're not constantly fusing and separating. They maintain their individual identity, uh, even though the fatty acid molecules go in and out of 
vesicles and into different vesicles very rapidly. Okay, so uh, I mentioned before that the self-assembly self of these vesicles uh, is autocatalytic. And let's just go back to that diagram. Um, several years ago, when uh, Marty Hanchik and Shelley Fujikawa were in my lab, they were thinking about the autocatalytic aspect of this process. I should mention that was first uh, uh, worked out in the lab of Pierluigi Luisi. Uh, and in fact, the fact that fatty acids could make vesicles like this was worked out a long time ago uh, in Dave Deemer's lab. So all of our work really builds on the pioneering efforts of the Deemer and the Lucy lab. Okay, so Marty and Shelley were thinking about the autocatalytic nature of vesicle self-assembly, and they thought, well, maybe it's something to do with these surfaces. There's some property of these negatively charged surfaces that uh, in some way catalyzes the assembly of new membranes. And so that made them think about what other kinds of surfaces might catalyze the same process. And so they started to think about various uh, mineral surfaces. And probably the most famous mineral, uh, at least in the prebiotic chemistry community, is uh, a clay mineral, uh, montmorillonite, uh, which was shown uh, many years ago by Jim Ferris uh, when he was doing a sabbatical with Leslie Orga uh, to catalyze the assembly of activated nucleotides into long strands of RNA. So we happen to have some of um, a sample of this clay from Jim. And uh, so Marty and Shelley just decided to see if, if that clay would catalyze this vesicle assembly uh, reaction. And uh, sure enough, it did. Uh, under some conditions, it can accelerate um, vesicle assembly by over 100 fold. And when they went to look at the resulting vesicles in the microscope, one of the really cool things they could see is that there are little particles of clay that end up uh, trapped inside the vesicles that they have uh, helped to assemble. <clears throat> so that made them think uh, about trying another experiment, which was to absorb some RNA molecules onto the surface of the clay. So mimicking a situation in which the clay had actually catalyzed the RNA assembly. And then see if that RNA-coated clay could also catalyze vesicle assembly. And uh, it did. And uh, that, those experiments resulted in uh, uh, some of these beautiful pictures where, where you can see here uh, in orange are uh, clay particles that are uh, bearing uh, uh, fluorescently tagged RNA molecules on their surface. And you can see that this uh, clay particle is trapped uh, within this large uh, vesicle, which in turn is filled with hundreds of smaller vesicles, all, all of which have been assembled under the influence of the surface uh, of this mineral particle. And the next slide just shows another example uh, of that. Uh, so again, a, a clay particle uh, with RNA molecules on its surface uh, inside a large vesicle, uh, in this case, many closely spaced bilayer membranes. So uh, these experiments, in essence, are showing that there's a, a simple, very common abundant mineral that on the one hand can catalyze the assembly of a genetic material, RNA, as shown by Jim Ferris. On the other hand, can catalyze the assembly of bilayer membrane, uh, as shown by uh, Marty and Shelley. And amazingly, can actually bring them all together. So it's bringing together the two main components of what uh, we think of as a simple uh, protocell. So it's hard not to um, to take the lesson from that that minerals may have played an important role in the origin of the first cell. Okay, so that brings us, that gives us the basic structure, but it doesn't really tell us very much about uh, how 
that the membrane could grow and divide. So you have a continuous cycle of growth and division. Uh, and it also doesn't tell us anything about how we're going to get that genetic material uh, to replicate. Okay. So uh, first I want to go over uh, some additional experiments that were done by uh, Marty Hanchik and Shelley Fujikawa uh, on uh, vesicle growth and division. Uh, I'm just going to go over this very uh, quickly. Uh, the basic idea, as I alluded to earlier, is that you can take pre-existing vesicles uh, which basically just sit there if they're left alone. Uh, and you can add uh, additional fatty acids in the form of micelles. And when they're mixed, molecules from the micelles uh, tend to integrate into the bilayer membrane so that it grows. And uh, that was first seen in cryo-EM experiments by the Luisi lab. And uh, we tend to uh, uh, use a fluorescence-based assay to follow the membrane growth. And here the idea is just an intercalated uh, donor and acceptor fluorescence size uh, get spread apart as they get diluted uh, when additional amphiphiles enter into the membrane. So the change in thread efficiency gives you a real-time assay that you can use to follow vesicle growth. And in doing lots of experiments of that sort, uh, Marty and Shelley were able to show that the, the growth could be very efficient in the sense that as much as 90% of the of newly added fatty acids could be incorporated into uh, preformed vesicles. Okay, so once they're grown, uh, it turns out that there's a very easy and efficient, if somewhat artificial, way of making them divide. And that is to simply take large vesicles and force them to small pores, and somehow on the other side come small vesicles. Now, um, exactly what happens is still not completely clear. Uh, but we do know that most of the contents remain inside. Okay, the surface to volume ratio changes, so of course you have to lose some uh, of the contents. But basically, the the um, the aqueous contents, whatever they are, retain, remain at the same concentration. So that tells us that the vesicle is not being ripped apart and then reforming once it exits the uh, pore, uh, but rather uh, a spherical vesicle is probably being elongated and then pinched apart, uh, more like a biological uh, division process. So uh, that's also very efficient, and that allows you to combine the uh, process of growth and division to make a cycle that can be repeated indefinitely. Uh, so for example, in this experiment, we start off with small vesicles. Uh, they grow, they're divided, grow, divide, grow, divide, grow, divide, etc. And in every generation, the contents are distributed to daughter vesicles, and the membrane material is also distributed to the daughter vesicle. So, in that sense, it's like a primitive form of cell division, okay, but only focusing on the membrane uh, part of the cell. Okay. All right, so, uh, so what about uh, the genetic contents? We need to have some kind of molecule that can encode information and have the potential to do something uh, useful for the cell in its cycle of growth and division. And so here, everything that we've done uh, completely builds on the pioneering work of the late Leslie Orgel, uh, who for decades uh, studied along with his students and colleagues uh, the chemistry of non-enzymatic uh, copying of templates, primarily RNA, but also DNA, and occasionally uh, he ventured a little bit further away into some related polymers, which is where we've taken up the experiment. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a classical type of orgel um, uh, chemical uh, copying of an RNA template strand. This is an experiment done by David Horning several years ago in the lab. And it shows you that uh, this kind of copying is uh, that can be slow, uh, but in some cases reasonably efficient. So here we're adding Gs to copy.
copy uh, a short stretch of C template. And you can see over a couple of days, uh, the primer grows by a couple of nucleotides. It works pretty well and pretty accurately uh, with, with C's and G's, uh, a lot more slowly uh, with A's and U's. And when you have the possibility for GU wobble base pairing, uh, the accuracy also tends to go down. So the basic problem that we've been trying to overcome are to find a chemical replication system that is fast, efficient, and accurate. In order to do that, we're stepping away from the requirement that everything absolutely has to be prebiotically reasonable. We just want to find some chemical system that works, and the hope is that eventually that will give us ideas that will let us go back to more plausible uh, prebiotic chemistry. Okay, so uh, in order to do that, what we're uh, looking at are monomers that are, uh, are different in several ways from the modern nucleoside triphosphates that are used to make RNA and DNA. So over uh, on this side, we have the modern biological monomers with their triphosphates. Um, these require very sophisticated enzymes to get the large rate enhancements that are required to make RNA and DNA uh, rapidly. Um, they're also very highly charged, which is good because that way they don't leak out of cells. Uh, what we need is something that is less charged so it could get across the membrane into the cell. We want it to be more reactive, so we use a hotter leaving group, things like imidazole. Uh, we use a hotter nucleophile, so typically an amine instead of a hydroxyl, it's the nucleophile. We also can play around with the nucleobase to try to modulate the strength of base pairing uh, or the accuracy of base pairing. We uh, can also play around with the sugar part of the monomer so that we make polymers with different sugar phosphate backbones. And that way we can play around with uh, the effects of uh, conformational constraint or flexibility uh, and so on. So when we use these modified building blocks, uh, these are the kinds of uh, nucleic acids uh, that we end up making. So at the top, we see the normal um, uh, phosphate diester types of polymers. Um, at the bottom, you see the corresponding nitrogen substituted versions, which are the phosphoramidate linked nucleic acids. And <clears throat> So on this side, we have um, the phosphoramidate analog of DNA. Uh, next to it, we have the same thing except with a 2 prime, 5 prime linkage instead of the standard 3 prime linkage. And this is interesting because in a lot of uh, Orgel's experiments, they found that um, with RNA mon monomers, you made a mixture of two prime and three prime linkages. So it seems that both kinds of links can easily form. Over here, uh, we have a slightly different sugar, a four carbon sugar, 3 O. So this makes TNA, um, a nucleic acid uh, first made in the Eschenmoser group, uh, which remarkably has a shorter backbone repeat unit, and yet it's still a perfectly good base pairing system. On the far side, we have uh, glycerol nucleic acid uh, with an acyclic uh, uh, backbone repeat unit. Again, uh, very different in structure from DNA, uh, but also a perfectly good base pairing system. So by looking at these different uh, polymers, we can assess uh, different factors that might contribute to uh, replication efficiency and accuracy, um, such as how well constrained or how flexible uh, the template is, how pre-organized templates are, um, how the helical geometry influences the reaction rate, and so on. So I'm not going to go through all of the chemistry involved uh, 
to make these polymers and the activated monomers. I, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples from our more most successful experiments. Okay, so uh, so here's one example where we're uh, copying a DNA template, which is a stretch of seeds, using this monomer, which is basically standard G, uh, hooked up uh, to deoxyribose with an amino group in the two prime position. And over here on the phosphate, we have imidazole as a leaving group. So it's a very reactive monomer. When you add it to this primer template, you can watch the primer get extended with a chain of G's as it copies the oligo C section of the template. And then the reaction stops when it hits the A's. You can see that over here. Here's the starting primer. Over the course of a few hours, you see all the intermediates. And then by six hours, you're accumulating full-length product. And at the end of the day, the reaction pretty much stopped with full-length copied template. So this is a reaction that is done completely without any enzyme. It's just a chemical uh, copy, template copying system. <clears throat> what we would like is to have something like this that is completely general, that works with all bases, that works with mixed sequence templates, um, and that works with very high accuracy. And so we're not there yet, but that's what we're going to be working on a lot over the next few years. The next slide here shows you a similar kind of example uh, where the monomer has the reactive nucleophile on the normal two prime position. And in this case, the monomer has, is an A residue, and this activated monomer can copy a stretch of T's. And so again, over here, we can see over uh, the course of uh, a day or two, the accumulation of full-length uh, copied template. The thing that's a little bit ironic is that uh, this three prime, three prime amino nucleotide system works well in copying A's and T's, but poorly for G's and C's. The one I showed you before works well with G's and C's, but poorly uh, for A's and T's. We don't really understand yet completely why that's the case, um, but we have some ideas. and We're trying to sort this out, and hopefully, in the end, we'll converge on a system that can copy any mixed sequence. Okay, but for now, we can use this kind of chemical template copier uh, as a model to look at some of the uh, more interesting questions about the interaction of nucleic acid replication and vesicle replication. Okay, so that's what I want to head into now. <clears throat> So one of the main issues in thinking about this is how to get those activated building blocks across the membrane bilayer to the inside of the vesicle where we want nucleic acid replication to be taking place. And we kind of avoided getting into these experiments for a long time because we were just used to thinking about modern biological membranes. And the idea that something as large, as polar, as charged as a nucleotide would get across a bilayer membrane without any kind of help from a channel or a pump uh, seemed kind of crazy. Uh, but in fact, uh, when you make the membranes out of the right building blocks, it turns out that it can work. Okay. So uh, we started looking at permeability several years ago uh, with somewhat smaller molecules, just the sugars. And these are experiments that were done uh, by Michael Fakrida when he was in my lab. And Michael used a very simple uh, intuitive assay uh, that is based on uh, making vesicles with an encapsulated fluorescent dye. When you add a solute, such as a sugar, uh, two vesicles with this uh, dye, calcium. The first thing that happens is that water rushes out of the vesicles uh, to equalize the osmotic pressure. 
The result is that the dye on the inside gets more, more concentrated, and uh, the fluorescence in this case is self-quenching, so the fluorescence intensity goes down. And then, more slowly, as solute and water gradually diffuse into the vesicle, it relaxes back to its, its initial uh, spherical state, and the dye becomes diluted, the quenching is reduced, and the fluorescence intensity returns to the original value. Okay, so I'm just going to show you uh, one of Michael's experiments in which he compared a set of four sugars. And these are uh, the four ribose and its three diastereomers, lixose, arabinose, and xylose. So they're very sugars, very uh, similar sugars. They differ only in whether the two and three prime hydroxyls are facing up or down relative to the plane of the, of the ring. So the results were pretty surprising. And the main thing we saw was that ribose entered these vesicles three to 10 times faster than its close relatives, lixose, arabinose, and xylose. So we still don't exactly know why that is. We have some models. There are experiments that could be done to test this. But the, the strikingly faster permeability of ribose, uh, I think, is very suggestive. And maybe the idea is that maybe this kind of unexpected physical property was just one of uh, perhaps many contributing factors that led to the emergence of ribose as the dominant sugar in uh, genetic polymers. So the idea is if you had a very primitive cell with some internal metabolism that made use of sugars from the outside, any cell that relied on ribose would have much easier, faster access to that substrate than a competing cell that required, for example, xylose or arabinose. Okay, so just a physical difference in the permeability of ribose would confer an advantage. Maybe that uh, is something rel relevant to the emergence of the RNA world. Okay, so having seen that we could get molecules as polar as sugars across these uh, across fatty acid membranes uh, reasonably rapidly, it encouraged us to look at larger and more polar molecules, namely the nucleotides that we need for uh, uh, for internal replication. And uh, so this is work that was done by Sharif Manzi when he was a postdoc in the lab up until about a year ago. And uh, what Sharif did to look at uh, the movement of nucleotides across a bilayer membrane was just to prepare vesicles that were loaded up uh, with uh, a particular nucleotide. And then he would just measure the rate at which material leaked out using size exclusion uh, chromatography. And what he found was that, as you can see from these, these top lines, represent data um, from normal nucleoside monophosphate. So these molecules have two negative charges on the phosphate. And they leak out very slowly, only a few percent over a day. But when you look at the uh, activated nucleotides, uh, the ones that have something like imidazole on the phosphate, they're, they have one less charge, and now you see that they leak out a lot faster. In fact, they equilibrate over uh, with a half time of about uh, about 12 hours. So, uh, so that this is with a model uh, system, which are these uh, 14 carbon uh, fatty acids, uh, and uh, uh, mixed in with the glycerol ester. We can look at the same thing using a more uh, prebiotically plausible mixture of uh, antiphiles, and that data is shown here. So this is a, uh, a set of uh, antiphiles that are 10 carbon saturated chains, and we see very similar uh, data, almost superimposable. Uh, so activated nucleotides, again, uh, can, can get across these, these membranes at a reasonable time scale. Okay, so now we have in hand the chemistry of template copying. Uh, we have this data, which shows that the monomers can get, in theory, into the inside of the vesicle. 
And so we thought maybe we could just put it all together. Oh, sorry, before I get to that, let me just tell you how we think things are actually getting across the, the membrane. So these are uh, two of the earlier uh, models. It's a classical desolvation model where to get a small molecule or an ion across the membrane, you strip off the water of solvation, essentially dissolve it in the hydrophobic interior, and then it exits the other side. That's just way too energetically expensive uh, to be plausible. Uh, the rate of this kind of process would be vanishingly small. The other possibility is that these membranes make transient pores that sort of open up and let stuff across. We know that's not really the case because if the pores had any significant size, at least they would let anything across equally. We wouldn't see specificity such, such as we see between the different sugars or the different nucleotides. So the model that we favor is a kind of hybrid uh, transient pore uh, model in which the solutes approach the surface of the membrane, uh, form polar interactions with the head groups of the lipid and nonpolar interactions with the acyl chains. And then there's a converted, concerted inversion of a transient complex through to the other side. So this model involves highly curved intermediate uh, states and, and that's supported by the fact that more cone-shaped antithiles uh, greatly increase permeability. Okay, so let's go back now to this issue of the compatibility of template copying and, uh, uh, and vesicle structure. Okay. So here's the experiment that I was uh, building up to before. In this case, we prepare vesicles that have the primer template on the inside, and we're adding the activated monomer to the outside. Okay, so here's the chemistry of the reaction, exactly the same as what you saw before. Uh, over uh, here is the solution control, so we see the primer converting to the plus 15 product over the course of about a day. And then on this side, we see exactly the same reaction going on inside vesicles. And you can see that it's a little bit slower. Um, it, it takes a bit longer to accumulate full-length material, but at the end of the day, we still have mostly uh, fully copied templates on the inside. So the, the slight delay reflects the extra time it takes for the activated nucleotides to go from outside the vesicle across the membrane to the inside, where they can take part in the template copying chemistry. Okay. So this is a big step forward to showing that the basic model that I described right at the beginning uh, is at least reasonable in the sense that we can add uh, activated building blocks to the outside and see copying of genetic materials on the inside. Uh, in this uh, particular experiment, the membranes are um, uh, one of our favorite models, which is a C14 unsaturated uh, fatty acids. Uh, in this experiment, uh, we see a more uh, prebiotic uh, set of antiphiles, again, the saturated 10-carbon uh, chain, uh, very similar uh, time course, and at the end of the day, we have mostly full-length copied templates inside these vesicles. And then finally, here is uh, the same kind of experiment, except using vesicles made of modern phospholipids. And in this case, the nucleotides can't get across, and you see absolutely no uh, copying of the uh, internal template. So the primer does not get elongated at all. So uh, in order for these systems to be compatible, you, you really do have to use the right building blocks to make the bilayer specifical. 
Okay. All right. So, uh, so we can do uh, template copying. Uh, if you just had efficient copying chemistry and, and, and ended up with a full-length duplex, that would be a dead end unless there was a way to get the strands apart so that the separated strands could be copied again. The obvious way to do that is by thermal cycling, just like we do for PCR reactions. But again, for years, we were kind of afraid to do that experiment uh, because we thought that if we heated our delicate fatty acid vesicles up to 95 degrees, they would just fall apart and everything would leak out and the experiment would be over. Uh, so uh, it wasn't until Sharif Mamdi actually did the experiments uh, that we realized uh, things weren't so bad after all. So here, in this experiment, what Sharif did was to uh, make vesicles with an encapsulated fragment of DNA and just monitor the rate at which it leaks out um, over time. So in this case, he heated the vesicles for an hour at the indicated temperature. And so you see the plain fatty acid vesicles start to leak at around 60 or 70 degrees and kind of fall apart uh, between 80 and 90. If you mix in a little of the corresponding fatty alcohol, the vesicles get more stable. And they don't really start to fall apart until between 90 and 100. If you mix in some of the glycerol ester of the fatty acid, it's amazing. I mean, you can take these vesicles and boil them for an hour, and none of the DNA leaks out at all. Even these less stable vesicles, you can do normal PCR-type thermocycling where you just heat up for a minute or so and nothing leaks out under those conditions. Pretty much the same thing is true with the shorter chain uh, saturated uh, fatty acid mixtures. Uh, fatty acid vesicles by themselves are unstable. Uh, they become more stable when you add the alcohol and much more stable when you add the glycerol ester. So, interestingly, these more complicated mixtures uh, always seem to work better. Uh, they're not as stable uh, as the previous set, uh, but, and this is a heating at an hour and monitoring leakage of a DNA fragment, but they're perfectly fine when heated up for a minute or two uh, to 95 degrees, nothing leaks out. So those experiments imply that an encapsulated uh, nucleic acid duplex could be heated up, could have the strands come apart, cool down, and then have template copying chemistry go on at the lower temperature. So we wanted to be sure that, that, that this strand separation would actually take place. And so the way that Sharif tested that is shown here. He encapsulated a short DNA duplex in which a small fraction of the, uh, uh, the DNA duplexes were labeled on each strand with a donor and a quencher, fluorophore. Um, so, so all the fluorescence is basically quenched at the beginning of the experiment because every donor has a nearby quencher. Most of the molecules are not labeled. When you heat them up, the strands come apart, everything floats around separately. When they're cooled down, the strands gradually re -anneal. But now the donor and quencher are usually separated. That results in an increase in fluorescence intensity, and that's exactly what he saw. Uh, the data correspond to uh, complete separation and randomization of the strands. Okay, so the thermocycling inside these uh, very simple primitive vesicles looks quite uh, plausible. As an added bonus, it turns out um, that the membranes become much more permeable uh, to polar molecules like nucleotides at these high temperatures. And so uh, what at room temperature uh, took hours to a day uh, occurs in a few minutes at 90 degrees. So if we have a, a, a short uh, temperature excursion, uh, go up to say 90 degrees, the strands come apart, uh, nucleotides from outside uh, can rapidly enter uh, in the course of a few minutes. And then the, as the temperature goes down, the membrane seals up and template copying chemistry uh, could happen. So we can start to imagine a very uh, simple environmentally driven 
driven uh, cell cycle, if you will, uh, that is driven by, uh, by fluctuations in the supply of building blocks for the, for the membrane, the F files, and, and in the temperature. Okay, so just to uh, uh, summarize, go over the, the main uh, points, uh, what, we, what we found in the course of doing these experiments is that we actually have uh, multiple pathways uh, for vesicle growth and division. I'll, I'll only describe one pathway for each today, but it uh, uh, turns out they're actually very robust in the sense that there are, uh, there are multiple ways in which both growth and division can happen. Uh, we know that nucleotides can get into vesicles, uh, that the vesicles are thermostable enough for strand separation. Uh, the chemistry of template copying is compatible with the existence and integrity of the vesicles. And uh, it's early days, but we think that the chemical approach to uh, copying nucleic acid uh, sequences uh, looks quite promising. And, um, and therefore, this bypasses the need to get started with a complicated uh, ribozyme structure, for example. Okay, so um, what of all of this is really relevant to the origin of life? And, and to me, I think the most general and important lesson is that as we, do, we and others do these kinds of experiments, we're continuously coming across very surprising, unexpected physical and chemical phenomena that might have played an important role. And um, so the ones I mentioned are shown here, this, this selective membrane permeability that favors ribose, um, the unexpected thermostability of, of uh, fatty acid membranes, um, the, the unexpected permeability, for example. A few other things I didn't have time to talk about are uh, earlier work by, uh, well, I did mention Jim Ferris's work, but also work by uh, uh, Pierre L.A. Monard on showing that uh, you can get RNA polymerization catalyzed by, by, uh, by freezing monomer uh, solutions. Uh, there are new ways of concentrating dilute uh, chemicals that are uh, quite interesting. Uh, and so on. There's just many, many uh, unexpected but very simple uh, chemical and physical phenomena uh, that I think could be very relevant to our understanding of the origin of life. And we're not going to find these unless people do these kinds of synthetic uh, experiments. And so finally, I just want to mention, uh, again, the people that did all this work, uh, all of this is done by a lot of really uh, brilliant uh, graduate students and postdocs. I've tried to mention many of them as I went along. Um, a, a lot of the more recent work on vesicles has been done by Ting Su, uh, and the nucleic acid work by Jason Shrum, uh, Jesse Chen, Alonzo Ricardo. Um, Sharif Manzi did a lot of the permeability and thermostability experiments. And, um, and thanks, we'd be happy to take any, any questions. Jack, thank you very much. Let's all thank our speakers. Jack, thanks very much for a great talk. I would encourage everybody to go to Jack's website because Jack has posted a number of movies that illustrate uh, some of those processes and particularly the processes by which my cells can merge and, and form vesicles and also the transport across the, uh, the membrane. And I think you'd find that very interesting. I'd like to ask the, uh, uh, the first question, and I would like to ask everybody else to raise your hand on WebEx, and then we'll call on you uh, to ask Jack questions. But just before I do, I'd just like to announce that the next NAI Director Seminar is going to be in just three weeks from now on November 24th, and it'll be Roger Summons talking about the mother of all extinctions, the uh, Permian-Triassic extinction, and uh, his work on the mechanisms that that cause that. So Jack, the question I'd like to ask you is what are your future directions and where do you think uh, you will be on this line of work, let us say five years from now? Uh, well, a lot of our work now is focused on the chemistry of nucleic acid replication. So 
Um, that's the big push. I, I'm reasonably optimistic that we'll find um, a system that lets us uh, do replication well enough that we can combine it uh, with a replicating vesicle system. And what we really want to be seeing is the emergence of the spontaneous emergence of sequences that, that contribute, that are selective. Uh, whether we'll be there in five years or not is a little bit hard to say, of course. Uh, there is one new direction that we've been having a lot of fun thinking about, and that is um, just knowing what we know from these experiments, can we actually start to design primitive living systems that would be chemically very different? Uh, for example, uh, things that would, uh, would live in a solvent other than water. And uh, it's a really interesting exercise. It, it really makes you appreciate uh, uh, the qualities of DNA and, and, and the forces that go into uh, membrane behavior and, and, uh, and, and nucleic acid duplex behavior. So it's an interesting exercise anyway. Thank you, Jack. Marco, do we have hands raised? Yes, we have a question from Ames. I wonder why you thought the clay catalyzed the formation of the micelles. Was it the pH of the clay itself that was low? Uh, we, we think it, uh, that the clay uh, works because of its surface charge. So it's not something that's very specific uh, to that clay. In fact, uh, almost any mineral surface that has a negative surface charge will, will work. And so we think that because of the electrical double layer at the surface, there's a, such an electrostatic effect that concentrates micelles uh, close to the surface, making it easier for them to uh, start to interact with each other. It's really just a, a kind of hand-waving model at this point, but that's, that's what we think is going on. Okay, thanks. We have a question at Wisconsin. Hi, can you hear me? This is Neetha Sahai at Wisconsin. Yes. Um, hi. hi. Um, I have a question about what you might think be the role of magnesium uh, in your uh, nucleic acid polymerization reactions as well as for the overall permeability of your uh, membrane, being that they're negatively charged, is also an electric double layer associated with the outside of the membrane. And there might have been probably higher magnesium in seawater as well as plenty of sodium um, than one has now. You see what I'm getting right. at with this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so work from Dave Deemer's lab uh, uh, showed that uh, these fatty acid-based membranes really don't tolerate very high concentrations of magnesium. Uh, so I, I think these kinds of membranes would not work in seawater. Uh, I, I think there has to be a, a more dilute, more of a freshwater uh, type of system. Uh, the, with the right mixtures of amphiphiles, you can tolerate up to, say, 4 millimolar magnesium. Uh, so that, for a long time, seemed like a big problem when we were stuck thinking about getting started uh, with ribozymes, because when we try to select new ribozymes that do, for example, polymerization um, uh, chemistry, they tend to require very, very high concentrations of divalent cations, like magnesium. Uh, which would not be compatible with the structure of the membrane. When we go to these uh, phosphoramidine polymers and the amino sugars, it turns out that chemistry is completely independent of divalent cations. So we can actually do everything uh, in an environment that you know, contains a certain amount of salt and some buffers, but um, does not have a lot of divalent cations. We have a question at UW. Yeah, uh, my question is, have you looked at any chemical controls on the size of these vesicles and whether or not it would be possible to have uh, a chemical mechanism for division as opposed to a physical one? Or is it something where you actually need the physical elongation to, to divide them in half? 
Uh, we've been looking at different pathways uh, for, for division. Um, uh, mo mostly, I guess, looking at, at uh, simple environmental ways uh, in which, you know, environmental fluctuations. Uh, I think there are much more plausible ways of doing it than this extrusion through small pores. That's really just a laboratory model. Uh, but in more recent experiments that aren't published yet, we can uh, we have systems where larger vesicles divide very easily, uh, uh, just with gentle shear forces. Now. Um, there's an interesting possibility for a more chemically mediated uh, division uh, based on the phase separation of lipids in the bilayer. So if you make domains, if you phase separate so there are domains with different lipid compositions, then there's a high energy uh, boundary between those domains. And minimization of that line tension can actually uh, drive division. And that's been seen in, in uh, phospholipid uh, single lipid cholesterol mixtures. We haven't been able uh, to make a system that works that way with single chain antifiles yet, but I think that would be a really cool way of doing it. I, I think it's still worth looking into. And there may, of course, be many other, other ways of uh, driving division chemicals. Okay, is there another question at Ames? Yeah, hi, Jack. This is Dave DeMarais. Um I was just thinking about pH when you were talking about your experiments. And, of course, at some point, the pH difference may have something to do with energy harvesting. But it, are there any considerations about pH in your experiments and whether or not they might uh, optimize the path? Right. Well, uh, the experiments that I talked about, uh, we basically use... Uh, we, we supply uh, new material, new fatty acids, as an alkaline uh, solution that goes into a buffered suspension of vesicles. And then uh, the my cells that were the stable phase at high pH now are a thermodynamically unstable phase. So, uh, so it's energetically downhill for those molecules to now uh, transfer into the bilayer uh, phase. Uh, so, so that's one aspect of it. The other is. I didn't have time to go into it, but under certain conditions uh, during growth, you actually drive the formation of pH and ion gradient. And that's because uh, new molecules come in first to the outer leaflets of the bilayer, but then they have to flip flop to the inside. And it's generally the, the, the protonated neutral uh, form of the fatty acid will do that in many orders of magnitude faster than the ionized form. And then it will re-equilibrate on the inside. So as you grow, you're essentially pumping protons into the interior. Now, so that results in a pH gradient, which could be used, uh, you know, perhaps uh, that some of that energy uh, could be tapped to do something useful. For example, take up uh, an amine substrate. Um, it's a little tricky because pH gradients decay very rapidly if there are free fatty acids around. Uh, but maybe some slightly more advanced membrane composition with, uh, for example, phosphorylated uh, monomers, uh, those retain a pH gradient for longer and might allow that, that uh, trapped energy to be, to be harvested. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank our speaker again. Jack, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack's seminar will be up on our website. The podcast usually is up within about three or four days, so by the end of this week or early next week, if you'd like to hear his seminar again, you can do so. And if you'd like to recommend his seminar to anybody who missed it this time, they'll be able to see it in its entirety. And I encourage you to also go back and take a look at the archives of all the past seminars. We've had a, a great run of speakers earlier this year and last year. Norm Sleep was uh, started us off this year. So just go to the website, take a look, and you'll see a lot of great seminars archived. And I hope to see you all in three weeks from now for Roger Summon Seminar. And Jack, thanks once again. Bye now. Thanks.